Well, hello, and welcome to our uh, Sunday night series, uh, our Bible study. Thank you for joining us online. Uh, if you've been following us uh, as of lately, we've been working through the book of Philippians, uh, and we concluded that study last week. Uh, and so this week we're starting a, a fresh, brand new study. Uh, so I hope you have uh, your, your scriptures with you. Uh, we're actually just going to be doing a lot of overview today, but we're going to be looking at the book of Ezekiel. And that might be a, a little bit different of a study for you. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different than our, our typical Bible study uh, in, say, like what we did with Philippians, where we, we went slowly uh, tackling just a handful of verses uh, and, and kind of dissecting them and, and getting a tremendous amount of application, hopefully, out of those. Uh, Ezekiel is going to be a little bit different, uh, namely because uh, Ezekiel is fairly unfamiliar to most people. And so uh, a study of the book of Ezekiel uh, is going to require uh, a little bit more reading on your part. Uh, and so I hope you're uh, maybe willing to, to put a, a few more minutes into a study like this to be prepared for it. Uh, so at, at the end of every study, I'll, I'll give you a section to read. And it'll be uh, anywhere from uh, maybe three to, to five uh, chapters or so. Uh, and, and really, if you if you really want to get the most out of this study, man, I, I just really encourage you uh, to do some reading beforehand. Uh, unless maybe Ezekiel is just a, a, a hobby of yours and, and it's a book that you're really familiar with, a prophet that, that you really enjoy reading. Uh, and so you're familiar with it. In that case, you're probably primed and ready to go uh, for a study like this. But I would say for the most part, most of us are, are, are fairly unfamiliar with the text. Uh, and so we're not going to be able to just read all of it. Sometimes we will. Sometimes we'll slow down. We'll be able to cover large uh, chunks of it and actually read it and, and talk about it. Uh, but for the a lot of the sections, we're just going to be able to read uh, like a paragraph out of this section and a paragraph out of this section uh, in order to move through three, four, five chapters uh, in, in our time frame. Uh, so if you haven't read those three, four, five chapters beforehand, uh, you're probably going to be kind of confused, not really know what's going on. Uh, and so I want you to be caught up and I want this to be a meaningful study for you. Uh, so I'm just asking you up front if you'll, you'll give uh, an extra 15 minutes to this study and do some reading beforehand. Uh, maybe uh, while you're you're on your commute to work, if if you know you're not just working from home these days, uh, you can find uh, a podcast of Ezekiel or uh, an audio section out of your Bible app, uh, and and it can just you can have them read it to you, or or maybe just uh, as your uh, first thing in the morning when you get up, uh, you just get yourself a cup of coffee. Uh, and spend some time just reading and some some nice quiet reflection. Uh, it could be a really good habit uh, to get you back into your to your word if if that's something that has has slipped because I know that that slips pretty easily for us. Uh, just speaking from personal experience. Uh, so uh, the book of Ezekiel uh, is is maybe unfamiliar to us because it involves a period of history that that we're not really comfortable with. We don't talk a lot about, and so that's something that we'll. Uh, recap and try and catch us up to speed on today. Our goal today is to give uh, just kind of a background of Ezekiel. Who is Ezekiel? What's the setting? What's the time frame? What's the history behind it? Because if you don't understand all of that, like the prophecies don't really make sense. The things that Ezekiel uh, is called to do by God, uh, they don't really make sense. You need to know what's happening historically, uh, as with all of the, the prophets. Really, I think one of the reasons we don't understand the minor prophets is because we're we're kind of unfamiliar with the history of the divided kingdom. So we'll talk about some of that today. And as we go, I'll, I'll be throwing these little tidbits of history back at you, kind of reminding you, keeping us up to speed, uh, because I think it's it's that important. Uh, a few things. I, for the most part, I think the book of Ezekiel is unfamiliar. Maybe, maybe people remember uh, like uh, the strange throne scene. Uh, in, in chapter 1, it's it's kind of been applied uh, in a lot of crazy ways. Uh, everything that I've heard from like alien abductions and stuff are happening in chapter 1. And, and it's kind of some crazy ideas. Uh, but uh, that might be something that you're familiar with. Or, or maybe uh, the Valley of Dry Bones uh, in, in chapter 37. Or uh, some of the early uh, kind of 
uh, street prophecies that Ezekiel does, some of the strange things God calls him to do. Uh, there, there's a lot of kind of tidbits that we remember from Ezekiel, uh, but maybe not the full story and the full prophecies uh, that are, are, are being displayed. Uh, and so since it's, it's an Old Testament and uh, a lot of the prophecies uh, we're going to kind of see uh, are, are saying similar things, uh, but just reworded in different ways or using different illustrations by God. Uh, as we'll take these larger chunks of text, uh, two, three, four, five chapters at a time, uh, which will help us uh, maybe move through them a little bit more quickly uh, and get the big picture of what's happening. Uh, and then every once in a while, uh, we'll stop and we'll hone in and we'll slow down and, and we'll get we'll pick up pra practical application as we go, obviously, because uh, the things that were happening in Ezekiel's day uh, were very different than what are happening today. But you will also find that there was humanity has not changed a whole lot. Maybe the historical circumstances are quite different, but humanity has not changed a whole lot. Uh, okay, let me give you just a, a, a big picture outline of Ezekiel. If we could just say, here's where we're going in this study so that you can kind of be ready for it. Uh, the first three chapters uh, are what uh, we're going to look at next week. So just FYI, that's what I'm going to ask you to read, the chapters 1, 2, and 3. And that's going to be Ezekiel's call. Uh, it's going to describe uh, Ezekiel and the situation he's in and God uh, appearing to Ezekiel and calling him to be a prophet. The second section is by far the largest section. It's chapters 4 through 24. So 20 chapters of Ezekiel preaching to the, the Israelites. And they're going to be uh, the, these people, these exiles in Babylonian captivity. And we'll talk about that history uh, as we go. Uh, then from chapters 25 through 32... We're going to see God referencing and judging uh, the foreign nations around Israel and what he has to say about them and why he's, he's bringing judgment on them. And then the, uh, the, we have uh, the next section is chapter 33 through, verse, or through chapter 37. Uh, and this is God's intention to restore Israel, uh, which is followed by chapters 40 through 48, which is this period of, of restoration and hope. And what God is going to do to bring His people back, and so ultimately you have this—you uh, have Ezekiel's call, you have the preaching to the Israelites, calling them to repentance, the judgments on the foreign nations, and then God restoring His people. Uh, and so that's kind of big picture where we'll be at uh, the, the topics that we'll be covering uh, throughout the book. All right, uh, some really prominent themes that we're going to see coming through the book quite often. Uh, a really important one that maybe you don't just, it doesn't just jump out of the text at you, but we're going to see it all over the book of Ezekiel, is the holiness of God. A lot of times God is going to be justifying his actions and, and, and letting the people realize why God is uh, bringing this captivity on them, why he's bringing judgment on them, uh, and it's because of his holiness. The flip side of that is man's sinfulness. Boy, we're going to see that a lot. We're going to really, uh, that's going to be one of the prominent themes of Israel's sinfulness. Uh, and this is their choice to go into sin and idolatry. Uh, and combining those two, hold the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, we're going to see the result of that. And that's God's toleration for sin and how there, there's a line. There's a boundary for God. He's only going to go so far with us. Uh uh, fourthly, we see man's individual responsibility towards sin. That Israel is not going to be uh, taken into captivity and judged uh, because of the sins of her, her forefathers or the sins of the four nations, but because of her choices, her individual sins. And then uh, a big theme towards the end of the book is God's desire to restore his people, to bring back into a right relationship. Uh, this, this whole captivity and judgment that he's bringing on his people has one purpose, and that's to bring them back. That's always God's desire, is to bring his people back who have gone astray. Uh, so uh, we're going to see Ezekiel as our prophet. Uh, and just so a quick snapshot of him as a man. His name, Ezekiel, means God strengthens. And as we go through the book, 
you're going to see like how important that name is, like how powerful that name really is. Uh, Ezekiel is in line to become a priest. Uh, he's at the beginning of the book. Uh, we're going to see that he is he's actually just coming to the age of being installed as a priest, uh, but he's not able to be a priest because he's in exile in Babylon. He's not back home in Jerusalem where he could serve in the temple. Uh, there's, uh, there's going to be three separate deportations, and we'll work through this history here in just a few minutes. Uh, but let me just kind of give you this to, to be rolling in your mind in case you're, you've forgotten this Old Testament history. There's three occasions in which Babylon is going to attack Jerusalem and deport a group of people. Three waves of deportation. The first one happens in 606, uh, and that's uh, when Daniel and you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all right, when, when these guys get taken into captivity. All right, and you remember that they end up in the king's palace serving as servants there. So that was the first wave of captivity in 606 BC. The second wave of captivity came when Nebuchadnezzar attacked in 597 BC. And Ezekiel was a part of that wave of captivity. Right, so he's being taken to Babylon, being uprooted from Jerusalem, taken into Babylon, and, and displaced there uh, and uh, with them. Uh, and that happens in 597. Then, then after Ezekiel... A third wave is going to come. Babylon's going to come. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come. Attack Jerusalem a third time. And that time, he's going to breach the wall. He's going to tear the city. He's going to burn the temple. Like Everything's going to be torn down. Uh, and that happens in 586. Uh, and that's our, our third and final uh, attack on Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. All right. Uh, Ezekiel's prophecies, the book of Ezekiel covers about 22 years. That's about uh, Ezekiel's time span. Uh, he goes into captivity at the age of 25. He's called by God at the age of 30. So five years into his captivity, he's being called by God, and he uh, preaches for 22 years. And so the, the last prophecy that he gets, and, and along the way we'll see these dates. Ezekiel's going to give us some dates along the way to help us keep track of everything. Uh, Ezekiel is 52 years old when he gives his final prophecy. Uh, so that gives us a little bit of snapshot of Ezekiel. Uh, okay, let's talk about the history that gets us up to where we're at with Ezekiel, uh, with the prophecies, with Babylon and everything like that. Uh, and then uh, and that'll, that'll be really the rest of our time. It'll be a good chunk of time, but uh, that'll be where we're talking. Uh, all right, so the divided kingdom. Uh, let's go all the way back to Solomon. If you remember, uh, we had the period of the United Kingdom, right? King Saul, King David, King Solomon. Like this were, These were the glory days of Israel. Well, Solomon has a son named Rehoboam. And Rehoboam takes the throne uh, upon Solomon's death. And Rehoboam is kind of divided on how he's going to run the kingdom. Should he run it uh, like his father? Should... Uh, he run it his own way. Should he be really hard on the people? Should he be soft on the people? He's not really sure how to run it. And so he goes for advice. And if you remember, this this story is really important to a, a huge turning point in the history of Israel. He goes to advice to the young men. And the young men give him this advice that, that you need to be hard on the people and you need to tax them hard and, and you need to show them your strength and they will respect you. And then he gets advice, and I think these are in reverse order, uh, he gets advice from the older generation. And the older generation says you need to be gentle on the people and they'll love you. Well, Rehoboam takes the advice of the younger generation and he he's hard on the people. And so uh, the people rise up and, and they call this man named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam uh, was the, the captain of the army uh, prior, and like, he had some, some political and military influence, uh, but th those days were kind of gone. And so Jeroboam comes, and he's going to kind of maybe talk to Rehoboam and, and, and try and settle all of this because the people are in revolt. Uh, and Rehoboam is unbending and so ultimately, in, in some ways, you could say that, that Jeroboam leads uh, a civil war in which the, the northern ten tribes 
break off from Israel. And all that's left are the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. So Rehoboam is in the south with two tribes uh, 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 under his control, while Rehoboam has taken the bulk of the nation of Israel and is leading them in the north. Well, this causes all kinds of problems. So now, instead of having this nice uniform kingdom of Saul and David and Solomon, now we, ha we have a history that's divided. We have in the north, we have a kingdom, and we have in the south, we have a kingdom, and two sets of kings are reigning. Uh, and so, you know, when you're reading chronicles and kings and it talks about this king rose and was a king of israel and this king rose was a king of judah and it, it, it can get really confusing if you're not seeing the big picture of there's a line of kings in the north which is a territory called israel and there's a line of kings in the south that's called judah and you have to kind of keep those kings separate geographically because they're reigning concurrently at the same time you know different kings are reigning but events can be happening and you need to know whether they're in the northern kingdoms uh the northern kingdom of israel or the southern kingdom of judah and where are prophets prophesying and then who are they calling out and, and all of those things so recognizing that rehoboam divides the kingdom uh, and jeroboam takes the north while rehoboam stays in the south well, one of the major problems with this whole divide, divided kingdom is that in the south is a key city called Jerusalem, right? And that's where the temple is, and that's where worship and the sacrifices and everything takes place. And so Jeroboam doesn't want the people of the north traveling to the southern kingdom to worship. And so Rehoboam sets up a, kind of a new system of religion for the people. He sets up altars in Dan and Bethel, so that, you know, in the northern part and the southern borders of the northern kingdom, so that the people don't have to go down to Jerusalem in order to worship. So they have their, their own places to worship, and, and they, they set up a, a kind of a, a makeshift altar and, and temple at Mount Gerizim where the people can come and worship. Well, the Levites... They don't. They want nothing to do with this. The Levites basically just abandoned the northern kingdom. Remember, the Levites didn't have a specific land section that were theirs. They were spread throughout the whole kingdom. Uh, and so they they just they ditched the north because they're not going to have any of this uh, this wavering from God's law and this setting up of new altars and and new feast days and and all of this. Uh, so they they come down to the south, which leaves really this this vacuum of spirituality in the north there's nobody left really to lead god's people spiritually and the northern kingdom just goes into idolatry real fast and real deep uh, and they stay there there's really not a bright spot in the northern tribes now in the southern tribes like the southern kingdom uh, there's going to be some bright spots, not, not a whole lot, but some bright spots, some kings that are going to rise up and, and do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. But as you're reading in your Kings and Chronicles of the kings in the north, you're going to re read this phrase over and over and over again. And they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so and so became king and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Like that phrase is just over and over again. A couple important kings ahab was just a terrible king that that brought uh idolatry into the nation so far so that they made baal worship one of the state religions uh, of of israel uh, and and this really set up the showdown if you remember on mount carmel of elijah uh, and the prophets of baal uh hoshea uh, was another important king because he was the last king in the north and what happened was uh there was a an assyrian king assyrian king not syrian but assyrian king named shalmaneser the fifth and shalmaneser the fifth had an agreement with the northern kingdom he said if, if you pay me tribute i won't attack you and we'll just you can basically just be in in subjection to us financially 
Well, Hoshea decided to break that agreement, and he refused to pay tribute to Shalmaneser V. And so the Assyrians came and conquered the northern ten tribes and took them into Assyrian captivity. Uh, and Shalmaneser V actually uh, continued his invasion all the way south to Jerusalem, right? And it was at Jerusalem that uh, his, his campaign was halted uh, because Manasseh, who was uh, the king, I'm sorry, Hezekiah, who was the king in the south at the time, prayed to God and brought uh, God into the picture. And I don't know if you remember that whole story. It's really kind of a cool story. And that night, while uh, Shalmaneser's army is camped outside of Jerusalem, an angel of the Lord comes and defeats the Assyrian army and slays 185,000 of them in one night. And they just, they pack up and they leave, right? sparing Jerusalem in the southern uh, kingdom. Uh, but the north gets taken into Assyrian captivity and, and is no more. Uh, because of their rank idolatry. Uh, and so uh, those are some of our, uh, you know, kind of our, some of our big, there's a lot of, of kings that were wicked and, and evil in the north, uh, but uh, that just kind of gives you a, uh, a snapshot. Okay, uh, in the south, uh, you have a, a series of kings. Uh, just We'll just kind of cruise through the series of kings in the south, and that'll set us up for where Ezekiel is. Uh, Manasseh uh, is one of our first kings in the south for the divided kingdom. And he sets up altars uh, in, the, in the temple. Altars in the temple. This is, this is important, right? And he sacrifices his son to Molech. I go, terror, like human sacrifices were just deplorable to God. Uh, yet one of the kings of Judah, he's not the only one that did it, uh, but he's one of the kings that did it. Uh, He's captured uh, by the Assyrians and, and taken captive. Uh, but while he's in captivity, he actually prays to God and repents. And God restores him uh, back to his, his throne. He hears him and restores him back to Jerusalem. It's kind of an interesting story. Uh, his son Ammon takes the throne, only reigns for a few months. Uh, and then Josiah takes the throne after him. And you remember Josiah is one of our, our good kings uh, and Josiah uh, takes the throne at age eight. Uh, and one of the important elements of Josiah's reign is that the book of the law is discovered, which makes you realize that the book of the law has been ignored for generations. And it's discovered under Josiah's reign. Anyway, uh, Josiah has uh, the book of the law read to him and he is just convicted. And he goes on this uh, this purging of idolatry throughout the land, uh, of tearing down the idols and the high places where these foreign gods were worshipped. Uh, and uh, just tremendous reforms are done by Josiah. He's a great king. He has a, an unfortunate demise. Uh, at the end of his reign, uh, Egypt in the south is uh, on their way up to uh, help Assyria fight off Babylon. Babylon is starting to gain momentum and power. And so they're uh, attacking uh, the capital city. And so uh, Egypt is on its way up there to defend uh, Syria in what uh, historically is the Battle of Nineveh. Uh, but Josiah actually intercepts the king of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho, uh, on his way and uh, tries to, to, to thwart Egypt from, from going up uh, to, to assist Assyria. Uh, and this was not God's plan. Uh, and Pharaoh Necho ends up defeating uh, uh, Josiah and his army. And Josiah is shot and killed in the, uh, that battle. Uh, and over the, the next three years, uh, after uh, Assyria loses that battle, uh, the Battle of Nineveh, after they lose that to, to Babylon, Assyria starts to just crumble and crumble and crumble over the next three years. Uh, well, while that's all kind of going on, uh, since Josiah dies, uh, he's seceded by Jehoahaz. Jehoahaz uh, takes the throne, but in, in a very weakened state now, because Egypt has defeated 
uh, Judah's army and killed their king. And so they really don't have much strength to stand on. And, and they're basically under the control of Egypt at this point. Uh, Pharaoh Necho uh, allows uh, Jehoahaz uh, to stay on the throne for just a little while. Uh, but, uh, but then uh, he, he, he decides that he needs to deport him to Egypt to get rid of him. Uh, after only three months, and then Joseph, uh, then Pharaoh Necho places Eliakim, or your Bible might call him Jehoiakim, uh, on the throne. Uh, and that was uh, in, in line. He's still a Jewish student, but uh, this was basically Pharaoh Necho's way of controlling and having great influence over Judah now, and, and uh, them paying tribute to Egypt. So. Uh, Jehoiakim is, is placed in power by Pharaoh uh, Necho, who's, who's kind of in control, if you will. Uh, and Judah is paying tribute to Egypt. Right? Well, then along comes the Battle of Carchemish. And this is really Assyria's last stand against Babylon. They've allied with Egypt yet again, and they're fighting against Babylon and all their allies. Uh, and Assyria is defeated, and now Babylon rules the world. Right. Babylon is the, the king. Uh, and so this causes Jehoiakim uh, to uh, rebel against Egypt and what's left of Egypt and start paying tribute to Babylon. Well, uh, after three years of that, uh, uh, Jehoiakim decides to stop paying tribute to Babylon. And that causes Nebuchadnezzar to bring his armies in and attack Jerusalem. And that is our first deportation. That's when Daniel and his friends end up being taken captive uh, because Jehoiakim refuses, uh, decides to refuse to pay tribute to Babylon. Uh, he was, uh, Jehoiakim was not a very good king, not a very good ruler, criticized often by the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, and so uh, he's he's taken out, and Jehoiachin is uh, the leader in his place. So we had Jehoiakim, and now we have Jehoiachin. Very similar, uh, but you got to keep those those two separate. Uh, he takes a throne at 18 years old, uh, and and quickly Babylon attacks again. And this is the second attack that happens in 597, and this is when Ezekiel uh, is taken into captivity with a whole host of other people. Uh, and then uh, now Jerusalem is in a very weakened state, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar puts Zedekiah as king uh, in, in place of Jehoiachin. Well, eventually Zedekiah rebels against Babylon as well. Like Apparently these kings, they're only good with paying tribute for so long uh, before they've just had it. They're done. They don't want to, they don't want to do it anymore. And uh, Zedekiah rebels against Nebuchadnezzar, and Jerusalem is attacked one last time in 586. Uh, and when I throw these dates out, let me just kind of, you know, you might you might read or you might have some dates in your Bible uh, that instead of 586, it says 587. Or, you know, there might be a year here or there. Uh, like, don't don't let that disrupt you. There's, there's a lot of um, uncertainty about the exact dates of things. Uh, Ezekiel is going to give us some exact dates along the way, uh, down like to the month and sometimes the day, and that's going to be fantastic. Uh, but a lot of these things, uh, it, it could be this year, or this year, and, and and maybe let me just kind of give you a reason why. Like depends on what you're talking about. So when does Nebuchadnezzar attack Jerusalem? Well, it's an 18 month siege. Like the attack lasts 18 months before he's able to breach the wall of Jerusalem. And so to throw these dates out, don't get too concerned about them being super exact because like this is history playing out and it takes a long time. These are, these are battles that take years uh, to, to take place sometimes. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar breaches the wall and he gets uh, in and actually attacks the city uh, in, in around 586, like the temple is destroyed, uh, the wall is destroyed, Jerusalem is brought to ruins uh, and is no more. And this begins a 70-year period of captivity, Babylonian captivity. At the end of those 70 years, 
Babylon is no longer going to be in the picture. It's going to be the Persians and, and the Medes. And there's going to be a, a restoration after that period of 70 years. Cyrus is going to declare that the Jews can come back and they can rebuild Jerusalem. They can rebuild the wall. And that's going to be uh, your, your Ezra, your Nehemiah, uh, those books, uh, Esther, uh, that, that, those books in that time frame uh, about kind of the rebuilding. But where Ezekiel falls is in this period of captivity. And specifically, Ezekiel is part of this second wave. And so the first 32 chapters of Ezekiel is going to be this period where Ezekiel is in captivity and Jerusalem is still standing. In chapter 33, Ezekiel is going to get word that Jerusalem has fallen. That Nebuchadnezzar has taken his armies in, he's breached the wall and conquered the city. And so the book of Ezekiel actually spans the from you know the, the early stages of the second wave of captivity through the final destruction of Jerusalem. And so we get to see that, that period of history play out. But remember where Ezekiel is. He's among the common people. He's, he's in captivity, but he's, a, he's kind of a commoner. Uh, he's not, he wasn't taken into the uh, palace like Daniel and his friends were. Uh, he's, he's just among the people, and he's going to be preaching among the people. Another prophet during this time period is Jeremiah. Jeremiah is actually in the city when the wall is breached. Right? So at the, he, he didn't get taken in the first wave. He didn't get taken in the second wave. And he's there during the... Uh, during the final uh, battle. But he's going to escape the city and end up going, uh, fleeing down to Egypt. And there's uh, kind of some different stories about that. Uh, but uh, Jeremiah is another prophet uh, that is contemporary to Ezekiel and Daniel. But he's in a totally different place, right? He's in Jerusalem uh, for part of his prophecies and, and, and fleeing to Egypt and part of his prophecies. So uh, we, have, we have three different prophets, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, uh, but they're in very different places doing uh, prophesying to different people uh, about different things. Uh, so that, that's kind of our, uh, our, our history there. Uh, all right, uh, so that's really our historical backdrop. Uh, it, it sets us up for uh, where Ezekiel is, because we're going to start right on, you know, when we start into chapter one, like, boom. Ezekiel is going to be uh, sitting by the river Chebar. Like, well, that's that's not in Jerusalem. He's going to be in captivity, and we're going to figure all of that out. Now, sometimes he's going to have visions that are going to take him back to Jerusalem, and we'll try and make this clear, you know, as to, to where things are happening and, and where Ezekiel is at and what he's seeing and where he's seeing it. Uh, but just remember, all of this time, Ezekiel has been uprooted from his home and, and stripped away uh, taken into captivity, re replaced uh, into a, a new home in a new city that he doesn't know anything about, right? And he's there with some of his Jewish people, but a lot of the Jewish people have been scattered throughout the empire as well. And that's that's who he's prophesying to is these people who have been defeated and taken into captivity. And a lot of a lot of what they're wondering is why? Why is God doing this? Uh, and much of Ezekiel is God letting them know what they've done and why he's doing it and what he intends to do to other nations and what he intend, how he intends to restore his people. Uh, it's a really, really great book. Uh, there's some kind of some crazy stuff in it. God's going to ask Ezekiel to do kind of some weird things. Uh, and uh, there's some really cool prophecies uh, as we get into the book uh, and towards the middle and towards the end. Uh, and so uh, there's there's kind of some so a lot of periods of judgment that we'll be working through, uh, but intermixed in all of that are just going to be some really neat chapters with some really interesting stuff. So I hope you'll stick with it. Uh, I don't know when the last time you had a Bible study on the book of Ezekiel was. It's probably been a little while. So I would really encourage you to take advantage of this. Uh, it's not these aren't books that we study very often because they're not in the New Testament. They're not super practical. They don't just fit into New Testament Christianity. It's a lot of history and understanding who God is and how he deals with his people. 
Uh, but I hope you'll take take the opportunity uh, to sit through uh, these next handful of weeks, however long it'll take us. It'll probably take us, I don't know, 16, 20 weeks, something like that to get through the book of Ezekiel. Uh, but be patient. And I, I promise you it's going to it's going to uh, reap rewards of just understanding a lot about the Old Testament, understanding a book that maybe you're not very familiar with at all, uh, and maybe just be refreshing to, to be in something new, uh, something different that you haven't studied in a long time. I, I sure hope it is. Uh, all right, so that's our introduction. Uh, next week, read chapters 1, 2, and 3. Uh, and you might not understand them. You're probably not going to understand chapters one, uh, but don't worry about it. Just read it. Try and understand. Try and get the images and the pictures in your mind, and we'll talk about it together uh, when when we get back. Sound good? Let's pray together. God, you're a great king, and, and we love you, and we thank you for your gifts, for your love for us. Uh, we don't deserve it, Father. I just pray that you would bless us as uh, we embark on this study of Ezekiel. Help us to learn from him as a prophet. Help us to learn from you as our God. Help us to learn from the people of Israel and, and their, their wickedness and the things that they did wrong and the things that they did right. Help us, Father, to see ourselves in them and, and to know uh, that, that you love us, that you're pursuing us through it all. Uh, but that you you have limits, Father. And, and I pray that we we are people who don't test those limits. I pray that we are people that, that you call to repentance and we respond. Uh, so help us, Father, to have soft hearts, to be moldable and malleable by you and your word. And I thank you, and I pray these things in Jesus' name.